Hi students, welcome back to the online video lectures of Medical Imaging course. In this video lecture, we'll go in more detail about X-ray imaging modality. Let's start with uh, a brief video that talks about how X-ray imaging works. It is part of a sequence of uh, videos made by Dr. Eric Strong and uh, what I'm going to present here is only a small portion of the first video that he has made. Let's go through it and then we will further continue our discussion. So how does a chest x-ray actually work? We need a source of x-rays, which themselves are a form of electromagnetic radiation. X-rays are carried by photons, just like visible light, but have higher frequencies and thus higher energies so they penetrate tissue much better. Unfortunately, these high energy photons can cause DNA damage leading to cancer, which is why X-ray exposure should be generally be limited. To detect the presence of X-rays, we'll need something called, appropriately enough, a detector. For the first 100 years of X-rays in medicine, the detector was a photographic plate or film. I'll add a sheet of unexposed X-ray film here. Now, however, most hospitals have replaced these with digital detectors, which allow for real-time viewing as well as improve post-exposure digital manipulation. Finally, of course, we'll need a patient to stand in between the source and the detector. This patient is in the typical position for a chest x-ray. She's facing away from the source, hands on her hips, and chest against the detector. The reason to put her hands on her hips is essentially to keep the arms from obscuring the view of the thorax. The reason she is standing in a way that intuitively seems backwards will be discussed in lesson 5. Now we have our source, our detector, and our patient, so we'll turn on the x-ray for a very brief predetermined length of time, and x-rays, that is high energy photons, will shoot out of the source. Some of these will pass right through the patient, some will be absorbed by the interposed organs and tissues, and some will be scattered. For the purpose of examining the x-ray film, it's actually the pattern of photons that are blocked which are of interest, as these create the shadows of the internal organs. So what are the factors that determine how many photons pass through a particular spot on a patient to reach the detector? In other words, the factors which determine shadow brightness. There are essentially three. The first is the density of the interposed tissue. Technically, this depends not just on the literal density as mass per unit volume, but also independently on the atomic mass of the particles in the interposed tissue. Let me show you some examples. So here is our table, and on it I'll place an empty glass jar. The jar is filled just with some air. On the far side of the jar is our photographic film. Notice that it starts off white. The x-ray source is then brought in. We fire some x-rays at the jar, which of course aren't in the visible spectrum like this might suggest. As the x-rays are traveling across the table, the ones that either pass around the jar or through the jar interact with the film. Here's what's left. Any part of the film where many x-rays struck has turned black. Parts of the film where no x-rays struck have remained white. And the parts of the film where a modest amount of x-rays struck show various shades of gray. Since air has a very low density, x-rays easily pass through the jar, and thus the jar appears empty on the film. Note that the metal lid has blocked nearly all of the x-rays, which has left a sharply demarcated rectangular patch of white unexposed film. Here's some more examples. Next, we can take a jar of water and do the exact same thing. Expose it briefly to x-rays, which also exposes the film behind it. In this case, water is denser than air, so it blocks more x-rays, and therefore the jar's contents now appear gray on the film. It's important to realize that even if the fluid in the jar is completely 100% transparent, it will still block x-rays and therefore look gray. The fraction of x-rays a substance blocks has absolutely nothing to do with its color or degree of translucency within the visible light spectrum. And now for a more interesting test subject. What happens when x-rays strike a skull? 
You can see that the resulting image is lighter than the jar of water, but not pure white like the image formed from the jar's metal cap. In summary, there is a spectrum of radio densities into which different materials fall. Those that allow most x-rays through are called radiolucent and appear black or near black on x-ray. Those that block most x-rays are called radio-opaque and appear white. For medical x-rays, there are essentially four classes of material. Air, which is the most radiolucent. Next is fluid and soft tissue. Then bone. And finally, metal. The next factor which determines shadow brightness is the thickness of the structure being x-rayed. If we take a single, relatively thin glass of water and expose it to x-rays, most will pass through, resulting in a very dark image on the film. If instead of one glass of water, we line up two glasses in a row and shoot x-rays through both, twice as many will be blocked. The resulting image will therefore be more gray because the specific part of the film corresponding to the shadow of the glasses have been relatively less exposed. Finally, if we shoot x-rays through three glasses of water, the image of the glass will be brighter still. In summary, the thicker the structure, the brighter it will appear on the x-ray film. The third and last factor is the duration of exposure. For the x-ray interpreter, this factor is only relevant when trying to understand a technical error in image acquisition. Imagine we have two glasses of water again, and I'm going to give these a very short or brief x-ray exposure. During that brief amount of time, few x-rays have an opportunity to pass through the water, so the film where the glass's shadow was cast is relatively underexposed, and thus is relatively bright. If I use a medium exposure, the film behind the glass will receive more x-rays, and thus the glass appears a little darker. Finally, if I use a very long exposure, even though the glasses of water are in the way, there is enough time for many x-rays to pass through, so the glasses appear fairly dark on the film. The bottom line, short exposures lead to images that are too bright, and long exposures lead to images that are too dark. This is the opposite of what most people initially expect, because intuitively, we assume that all film starts off black and turns white after exposure to light, but remember, x-ray film is the opposite. Let's return to our patient, who has been patiently waiting for us in the radiology department. And let's fire some x-rays at her. You can see that some pass through, some get absorbed, and a few even get scattered around the room. The result is an image formed on the photographic film of the shadows cast by the various structures in the patient's chest. And here is that result. From the pattern of white, black, and gray, we can infer things about those chest structures. For one, this area here, because it is generally relatively dark, it must correspond to an air-filled structure, a lung. This area here, which is a medium gray in brightness, must correspond to a structure composed of either fluid and or soft tissue, in this case, the heart. I hope this video had made it clear to you the effects of the density, the thickness, and also the exposure time on the resulting X-ray image. With that background, let's dig a bit more deep here. Assume that this is the tissue that we would like to scan it using X-ray beam. This thickness being capital D. This inside that assume that there is a region of air as well as bone here. Now look at the intensity at this point of this X-ray beam. Let that be I naught here. Now, once it has passed through it, assume that you are again taking profiling of it on this side. Assume that in these regions, okay, this capital I subscript T is the intensity. Assume that for a tissue. What would happen for air as we have seen in the previous video? The density being uh, small there, it its absorption would be less x-rays that it going to absorb would be less so that profile will have a higher value if you assume that a ray passing through purely the tissue itself is having an intensity of i1 now this could have a higher value than that which could be i2 
Now consider a region where you have a bone. The absorption is more for bone than either the air or the tissue. So what you could expect here compared to the I1 value is lower intensity. Now another point that is perhaps already clear to you is the intensities you get on the photographic plate or on the digitally recorded values would be inversely proportional. That means lower the intensity here, higher the value. That's why in the X-ray imaging for bones, which in fact absorb the highest X-rays, that you would be getting there a high intensity there. So the profiling that we are calling here is in I in is the input intensity values uh, of the X-ray beams and whatever has come out of our object of interest and uh, hitting the X-ray detector is I out. Let's now take a look at, uh, for example, what is the contrast that you would like to obtain here when compared to the ratio of input intensity to output intensity. So these are the typical graphs that would be used for transforming these uh, E value, okay, which is the ratio of input intensity to the output intensity to the value that you see either on the digital film or X-ray film. This is by the way on a logarithmic scale. When this is small, this is like you won't observe any difference here. Similarly, when this value is too large, the values of intensities to which it gets mapped is also small there but it is in between you will have a range over which even a small change in the ratio of input to the output intensity is amplified here. The shape of this curve varies depending on what are the exactly the structures that, that you would like to see with the maximum contrast. By this time you should be already clear that for what purposes these x-rays could be used. Particularly this is used for bones and then in terms of the organs, if you look at one common thing for uh, dental examinations, this is used and you could see some pictures here, for example, for orthopedic evaluations and for chest x-rays and to detect any infections in our lungs also. This is something you could observe here, some abnormality kind of thing. So for such examinations also, these x-rays are used. Some more examples, if there is any fracture in the wrist, for example, they would like to see. And similarly in the forearm, pelvis, elbow, hand, wherever bones are involved, this is something that is commonly used. One particular form of x-rays is mammographic imaging, where this is used for detection of tumors in the breast imaging. For example, depending on the texture or density that you observe in the x-ray imaging, the classification is done. For example, although you see a lump here, this is in fact a benign tumor and you would see another lump here. Again, that's being a malignant tumor. For the screening of breast cancer, x-ray imaging is widely used. These are the again different variations of uh, x-ray imaging. In particular projection radiography where your uh, output x-ray imaging is a 2D imaging. Let's quickly see how the equipment would look like to get just a feel of it. The first image here on the left hand side I'm sure most of you uh, would be familiar where chest x-ray has to be taken. This is where you have the source of x-ray. This is how you would uh, stand in. So this is from posterior to anterior position and uh, this is where uh, the digital recording or the x-ray sensitive detector is kept here and this is how the imaging is taken. This is another setup where the patient would be lying on a table and you have the x-ray source here and all the recording has been done here and of course the control will be somewhere in a different place here from which it can be inspected and monitored and parameters also can be controlled. This is an example of a setup uh, for angiography system depending on the manufacturer of this equipment even for the same application of angiography you will come across different uh, types of uh, shapes for this equipment these are just some examples to give you a feel this is how the angiography system would look like where the patient would be lying here this is a mobile table or this would move here i guess 
and then there is a real time monitoring here the angiography that is to uh, take a look at uh, the healthy condition of the blood vessels the setup will be in such a way that if they see the blockage at the same time they would be able to clear those blockages that's how the angiography system would look like this is for neuroradiology i think ct scan where you obtain 3d image of the brain also would look very similar to that but this is for neuroradiology example again another specialization of x-rays as we were mentioning as where the patient is not mobile so the whole x-ray system has to be in a way that it could be moved for example you would like to monitor how the lungs are functioning for a subject so one difference just i would point out here but will not go into detail right now is now that it is taken in anterior to posterior for observing the lungs because of the constraints that are there in moving the patient here by the way the x ray detector would be kept back side him uh, let's say on him back side on his uh, back here and then this is how you would be projecting the constraints coming from the condition and mobility of the patient but in this case this is how for example one possible setup that you would come across for mobile x rays and another important setup here is for mammography where the breast cancer is uh, analyzed inspected and screen here so you would have the plate here now this is where the object uh, that needs to be inspected is uh, kept and then uh, monitoring setup will be there away from it has to keep them away from the radiation effects and then of course in similar lines uh, if you have gone for any dental examination you would there come across setup where they use x rays now to take uh, the x ray of the teeth to inspect its condition yeah that's all for now for the x ray part so in the coming classes what we would do is we would more focus on now the image processing aspects of medical imaging like for example as i mentioned this graph is telling you that whenever you are the ratio of input intensity to output intensity how it has to be mapped to the intensities that you would get on the x ray detecting plate or the digitally recorded x ray image such that you could get a better contrast so this would be our focus for the next few classes okay see from the coming class onwards we would be focusing on image enhancement techniques in the spatial domain thank you for watching see you in the next video lecture bye take care